Done. Let's go. Hey, everybody. This is Harvey Sluggo Wasserman. I'm with you today for the 95th, count them, 95th Green Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition uh, video and Zoom. Uh, it will be uh, broadcast live at prn.fm uh, or prn.live uh, on Thursday, 5 p.m. We are gathered today to deal, as always, with our um, most important and uh, uh, most pressing election protection and environmental protection issues. Um, uh, we have 50 people on with us today. Generally, that goes up as we proceed. I do want to welcome Christian Nunez, the president of the National Organization for Women. Uh, Christian will be talking to us today uh, at the beginning, right up front, uh, about the horrific a nationwide battle uh, over Roe v. Wade and abortion rights. We will be dealing with that for most of the first hour. It is now a little past 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, at 6 p.m. Eastern time, uh, we will shift over and start to talk about uh, legislation in Arizona uh, with Susan Pinchon and a, um, a major confrontation going on in North Carolina. Uh, we also have some uh, a green power issues to deal with, uh, a, an attempt uh, by uh, uh, at least one governor to punish uh, in capitalist investors in renewable energy. And we have Ron Leonard on to talk about that. We're just joined by Susan Pinchon, who'll be reporting uh, to us from North Carolina. We have the ongoing insane battles uh, over gerrymandering uh, to talk about. Uh, also, of course, and we may do this in the first hour along with the, the road discussion, the, the latest mass shooting, uh, this one in Buffalo of 10 people, all people of color, um, uh, the, and the defense of this murder, this mass murder uh, uh, by Steve Bannon and others uh, as uh, excused uh, killing to prevent the so-called replacement of white people in this country. Steve Bannon, uh, I, I watched his podcast, uh, at least a segment of it, uh, where he basically defended uh, this mass murder as part of their political program. Uh, I see we're joined by uh, the great talk host, uh, uh, Dennis Bernstein, the um, uh, host of the fabulous uh, Flashpoints uh, show, which is being uh, broadcast all over the Pacifica network. We may say a thing or two about the Pacifica Network, uh, which is under uh, anti-democratic attack and really needs to be defended now. We desperately need a healthy Pacifica Network and right now we don't have it. But our primary focus today, at least for the first hour, uh, is gonna be uh, uh, the, the uh, overturn, the imminent overturn of Roe v. Wade. We had an incredible hour last week uh, led off by the great Mimi Kennedy. And this week, we're gonna have another incredible hour uh, led off by the fabulous uh, Kristen Nunez, the president of the National Organization for Women. We also have with us Joel Siegel, our constitutional law expert and uh, co-convener. We are engineered as usual today by the great Mike Hurst of the Progressive Democrats of America and um, uh, Steve Caruso, who's also our webmaster uh, in, in rural central Ohio. We, got, we have plenty of diversity at, at, on these calls and among them is of course uh, our geography. We're all over the map. Um, uh, I wanna welcome Christian Nunez uh, to the call. Uh, Christian, if you can unmute and um, uh, uh, say hello to us. You are the president of the National Organization for Women. Uh, we, we know of course that this decision, and I again wanna reiterate my profound support for whoever leaked that um, uh, uh, decision uh, as written, at least the opinion written by uh, the, uh, you know, I can't, I, I find myself unable to call these guys justices. Mm -hmm. So he is a member of the US Supreme Court uh, who lied at his um, uh, um, uh, interview, basically his job interview with the US Senate and said uh, he referred as did uh, three other justice uh, uh, members of the Supreme Court who were confirmed under false pretenses. He referred to Roe v. Wade as settled precedent, implying very strongly that he would not 
overturn it. And here we see that he certainly um, uh, intends to do so. And it, of course, is about as big a political earthquake as we could experience in this country. Uh, Christian, as president of the National Organization for Women, um, you are going to be leading the charge on this. And we are honored to have you. Uh, we would love to hear uh, what you have to say about the the battle that we're now involved in uh, with the National uh, Organization for Women and other uh, uh, pro-choice groups, uh, freedom groups, uh, uh, female uh, advocacy groups to protect a woman's um, uh, uh, right to control her own body. Uh, a Christian, if you could take it away, we're, we're, we're all waiting to hear from you. Hi, Harvey. Thank you for having me, PDA. Thank you for having me and all my fellow activists and friends um, online. Uh, yes. Hi, Joel. I see that beard growing in. <laughs> um, yes. It's, uh, thank you all for just having me um, come talk about just, um, I mean, it's been a really intense few weeks. Um, as many of you, I'm sure, have witnessed and heard what's been happening um, about the leaked draft and what's happening, what's coming up in June. Um, I think we're all like anxiously anticipating the decision that's supposed to be late, happening in June regarding Jackson um, and the Dobbs case. And so I think that what we really know, I, I guess I kind of agree with Harvey in some ways. You know, when we heard the oral arguments um, early in the year, I think the oral arguments and some of the some of the kind of like responses from the justices kind of let us know how their opinions um, and their value system was leaning, um, and that they're possibly were even considering overturning Roe by what they kind of felt during the oral, oral arguments. But to actually see this leaked draft come from Alito and to see the thought process. Um, the ide ideology that he had um, and that it really truly is a reality of, um, you know, more than 50 years of protections being overturned. I think um, that is what is really concerning and terrifying that the possibility of a complete ban on abortion care could possibly be a reality for many, many, many uh, women and pregnant persons in the United States. And it is going to harm many women and families. And I think it's just really, it's an uncomfortable thing to think about. Um, a lot of times, and I, and I think also we have to think about true, how this is more than just about reproductive rights and justice, this is about our constitutional rights and our human rights um, and how, in this fight, we also can prove our power at the ballot box um, and coming up with midterms and, and, and as we continue forward. Um, so this all is so intertwined and intersects. Um, so let's talk about what we know for sure. But first I wanna always start this conversation out when I come and talk by letting everybody know to be clear that telling everybody that right now abortion is still very legal and it remains a constitutional right as of today. So I want to always put that out there so people don't feel like it, is, it has been banned and overturned. It is not overturned yet. It is still legal and it is a constitutional right you have. Now we know that some states have made bans and people do have to travel out of states in some places to get access and care. But um, it is, and it is a moment of crisis for many people, but there is, it is, there is still abortion access available. Um, and although the court is prepared to end this constitutional right, um, there has been so much, um, so many people coming forward, grassroots activists, of course, allies coming forward to say that like oh, there's over 70% people who believe that this should be a woman's choice to make the decision for themselves and that believing that this right should be available. So, and it is not, and becomes um, a unifying right for a person to have that ability to make that choice. Um, and this is not the end goal for abortion movement. So we wanna talk about that too, is that this becomes a gateway for those who are right-wing extremists. This is a gateway to 
lead to other ways of oppressing people, oppressing women, oppressing other civil rights movements. And so if we allow this to happen, or if we don't fight with all our might, um, this is just a great way for them to go ahead and attack other freedoms. And then we can clearly see this in Alito's draft, um, how he talked about it, how he talked about, well, women were never protected in the original uh, makings of the constitution, the original writing. So uh, why would we need to give them those rights now? <laughs> you know, because um, we think about it, you know, um, well, a lot of people were not originally given provisions or treated as 100% equal or owning their own bodies or having their own rights in the original writings. So just for him to be able to draft that and use that as his understanding of why it's okay to overturn Roe is really concerning. And I know when I personally read, I mean, I, it was so much misogyny. Um, and I think, you know, uh, this kind of institutionalized and, and covered micro or macro racial aggressions and racism that was embedded in his draft. Um, and I think it just led to us believing like what are what these what these uh, justices really failed to do, like Harvey could be said, they failed to really truly protect and stand up for the people. So we're looking at over 50 years being turned away, um, a full wage on war on women, because also some of these states who have moved forward and um, who will know that this possibility of Roe being overturned have already 26 states have trigger laws, which means that as soon as Roe is overturned, they're going to immediately enforce abortion bans in their states. Some of these states like Louisiana just passed a law to ban abortion. Um, and in that law and in their ban, they make abortion a homicide. So when you think about this, this goes back to even oppressing more people of marginalized communities, criminalizing women, criminalizing those who get portions, persons who get, who get pregnant and choose for their free right to have a, um, their own bodily autonomy. And there are other states who are choosing to make it a death penalty if you get an abortion. So this goes way beyond just you know, we don't want you, we're talking about pro-life. You can't make a pro-life argument if you're willing to kill a woman or a pregnant person for choosing to make their own choice, the reproductive rights and their reproductive care. So this is why this is not about religion. This is why this is not about pro-life. This is a political game. This is a political fight. This is about controlling. This is about a war against women. This is about a war about, um, about, about oppressing people who already have been oppressed for so very long. Um, so this is about protecting privacy. This, this is about reforming the courts. It's about passing the Health Protection Act. And it's about all so many things that we have to do. And this is about making sure that we're working hard on our elections to remove all these people who have been contributing to putting legislation in place in states that have been oppressing people, continues to perpetuate racism, continue to perpetuate violence, continue to perpetuate misogyny. This is what we are called to do as activists, um, as progressives, as feminists, as allies, to come in and say that we will not allow this to continue to happen and we defeat everyone who's trying to make and take make laws like this in place and take away our constitutional rights. So I think this is the perfect place to talk about this when we're talking about election protection because this goes to our election, right? This goes to our rights. Um, and we cannot no longer allow right wing majority, um, take away our fundamental values, um, ban those rights from us, restrict us, uh, try to control us, um, harm us because this is harm, black and brown, indigenous people, when those on poverty, immigrants, uh, disabled are the ones that are most directly impacted by these bans. And then you wanna turn around and criminalize them as well. So adding to increasing prisons, adding to criminalizing them, putting long records on them for making choices, but then you don't want to at the same time provide Medicare for all. You don't want to provide more foods, you know, more grocery stores in their communities to help them feed their children. You want to have restrict formula for those on WIC because we have a shortage. We're not, this doesn't make sense people. <laughs> so we have to really look at what we're seeing and how these fights are not really what they're calling them, but really about 
how we are trying to um, oppress those who need more and war, wage war on them. Um, and so we have to work hard in selection to remove everyone's possible who's out here trying to use reproductive rights and abortion as a gateway to end our freedoms. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, well, I wanna ask you a question, uh, Christian. Thank you for that beautiful, brilliant statement. What are the plans of the National Organization for Women to uh, uh, fight this? What are you looking at demonstrations on um, uh, what kind of organizing uh, is going on and how can our the people on this call and do raise your hands. Oh, I see we've got a few hands already. Absolutely. Um, um, what, what is the national organization for women going to do and will you post your contacts in the chat so that people can be in touch with you and sign up to work with you. Absolutely. So we are the largest, oldest um, grassroots, grassroots organization, women's rights organization around. And so we're going back to our roots of the grassroots work. We know that this is more than a federal fight at the Supreme Court. We have to go back hyper local. So we're looking at going back and really working on how we are helping recruit candidates, um, organizing on the, on the local level and the states, um, identifying, looking at the states who um, we know where there are currently laws in place where they're trying to um, truly um, put laws in place right now with abortion bans. Um, kind of like almost like it's a whole new type of battleground state, right? It's abortion battleground um, that we're looking at too, where they're ready to start putting legislation passing it through because they know it's a possibility for world overturning. So not only are we working on a federal level with the rallies and parting the bands off our bodies.org. So if you're looking to attend a rally or do that, that action of mass mobilization, we're part of the bands off our bodies, um, mass mobilization partners with all the coalitions of reproductive groups. And we encourage everyone to go back to that website. I'll drop it in the chat and you can attend um, any type of mass mobilization rally that's happening in your states or DC area, um, all around the places. Um, they are organizing um, the local groups in the states um, and in DC, DMV area. Those will be happening all the way through the summer up into the decision um, that's gonna be happening. So that's one thing. They're also gonna be having a caravan that'll be happening in June. they will be going from, I believe from Mississippi. Um, I'm not sure, I just a destination. Um, addressing the whole issue of abortion access and the bans. So that'll be happening um, and building up to a huge mass co uh, convention that will be happening um, and where we're taking back our space in Texas in August. So we're part of those movements. So I'll drop the website bans off, our, our off that org if you're interested in continuing those things. As can regarding- you, um, uh, For the benefit of our radio listeners, uh, can you spell out the uh, website that people should go to? Yes, it's uh, www.b as a boy, a as an apple, n like Nancy, s like Sam, o like Oscar, f like Frank, f like Frank, dot org, bands off dot org. Fantastic. Okay, well, we, we are certainly reliant on the National Organization for Women to help lead the charge here. And then we'll also, hear... go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was saying the last thing we're going to be doing is we're also going to be working on how we possibly can then try to figure out how we can introduce opposite legislation to counteract um, some of the negative legislation. So those are different things we're doing as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for that. I'm going to stick with us. I hope we have 82 people on the call with us. Uh, one of the uh, drawbacks of being on a call that's being moderated by a history professor is that I do have an issue to raise with um, these these ju these so-called um, um, I won't I can't judges but not justices uh, keep talking about uh, originalism and the Constitution and they fail always they fail to real remember that the original constitutions of uh, in place in North America were with the indigenous and this is a theory that has become known as indigenous originalism. And all of the tribes of North America, and uh, Christian, I've written an op-ed about this, which I will send to you, see if you want to sign on to it. But um, uh, none of the tribes that we know of in North America, prior to the coming of the white people, banned abortion. 
They, most of them were matriarchies. They controlled their own reproductive choice through herbal means, uh, which of course is another part of this we're gonna discuss. I know that Joel Siegel wants to speak to the question of the, of the pill and the abortion pill, how that's gonna play into this. And actually we'd like to hear from you on that. Uh, uh, Christian, but the reality is that the original constitutions of what's now North America never contemplated uh, a government that would intrude itself into the uterus of a woman. Uh, abortion was freely uh, uh, practiced uh, for 20,000 years by the indigenous nations of North America through herbal means, strictly by the choice uh, of the female. And most of these tribes were matriarchies. They were run by women. And I got to tell you, if a man in the average, uh, uh, you know, uh, indigenous tribe in North America, America, prior to the coming of the whites, had come forward and told a woman that she could not control her own reproductive choices, I, I think there would have been a lot of blank stares uh, followed by some serious hostility. And this is one of the things that we never hear from the, the judicial system of the United States, the white dominated judicial system of the United States is the 20,000 years prior to the coming of the whites, um, uh, these rights uh, were just an assumed part uh, of, the, of the matriarchal culture. And, and yes. um, I'm prompted uh, further to speak to this because there are, there's news now that the governor of Oklahoma uh, some nasty right-wing white guy wants to take steps to override the treaty rights of the indigenous tribes in Oklahoma, which was set aside as a reserve for indigenous people in the 1820s. And they, um, according to treaty rights, the indigenous tribes have every right to establish uh, clinics for women to control their own bodies. And we have the governor of Oklahoma proposing bill after bill after bill to override the indigenous rights on these reservations of the, of the tribal governments to establish um, a, a, you know, Planned Parenthood and other uh, uh, female rights uh, and female choice uh, 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 clinics. You wanna speak for a moment to that, um, uh, Christian? Well, I was going to say it's, it's what what's interesting too is like you know if you really think about it too is that many countries that are considered more um, more conservative um, stricter have better abortion access for that same you know for a lot of reasons they consider it a right a basic you know healthcare right they consider a, a right that women have um, to their healthcare a right the pregnant persons have to the healthcare. Um, and so it's, it's so, so they do feel like, because they also practice natural, naturopathic medicine, they believe it's part of a, a natural part of uh, a decision to, and a right to access a root of care. So there's countries like Kenya that have passed and have more access to abortion access and care than the United States of America. And when you think about that, when you think about that we call ourselves one of the most free democracies of all times, but when it comes to the reproductive rights of women, we have some of the most restrictions ever. That makes you really think about it. You know, like we, we want to compare ourselves saying we get the most rights and freedoms, but when it comes to women's bodies, we don't. Um, and there, there wasn't, wasn't a time in, in the history of abortion until, um, like you said, there was, it's about control in some ways. And when people wanted to start controlling what they felt um, and what they wanted to interfere with. Um, and also there was a time in history too when, um, when non-white providers started providing services when they wanted to start interfering a lot to, with re restrictions. So I wanna put that out there too. Yes, and I want there. to add, I, I said very, I, we're talking with uh, Christian Nunez, by the way, for those of you on the radio, um, uh, she is the president of the National Organization for Women. We're having an open discussion for the second week in a row on the, on the uh, uh, Roe v. Wade um, uh, conflict and the uh, imminent overriding uh, of Roe v. Wade by the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, I do want to point out, as I did last week, that if people are really interested in stopping abortion from happening, 
the number one organization to support is Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood, which started in the early 1900s, has been disseminating the two most important factors in preventing abortions from happening, which are sex education and contraception. If you are really, into, and I have never understood in any rational sense why anyone who thinks they don't want to have abortions prevalent in a society would oppose birth control or sex education. I mean, I don't know percentages, but I, I'll bet you a good half of the people under 25 who get pregnant uh, don't know what happened. And they, they don't, just don't understand it. And, and if you really want to stop abortion, um, um, then, then support Planned Parenthood, support sex education, and support the universal dissemination uh, of birth control and contraception. If you oppose those, then it seems to me maybe something else is at work here. We have nice Slogo. Yes, Mike. Slogo, we should also support now. Yes, yes. And support, support the National Association. And we 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 are for women, which means we take all members. <laughs> I like to point that out <laughs> all the time. So well, anyone can be a member national, now. Or, you're the national organization for women as exactly. well as of women. Exactly. Well, Thank great. you, Mike. Okay. And speaking of which, now we got a lot of people with their hands up. I'm going to start with the women. Uh, first, Mary, uh, and then Charlotte, and then we'll go to Dennis and, um, and Joel. And well, we'll go ahead. Uh, Mary, go ahead, please. Mary Stonewall, Butler Stonewall, please. Uh, if you want to unmute, we have 93 people on the call. Um, uh, Mary, Mary Butler Stonewall, followed by Charlotte Dennett. Yeah. Um, okay, go ahead, Mary. Three points. Go ahead, first, quickly, please. First, uh, the federal government's only jurisdiction is to protect one state's actions from another's. They have no jurisdiction in our homes, in our houses, or in our town. Number two, we should have had an uprising long ago because once Oklahoma made it past the law that said a pregnant woman beaten by her husband or boyfriend and the baby dies in her womb, she goes to jail for murder. That right there was a travesty that that law even passed and that we didn't, I knew that was a precursor to what we're seeing today and I stated so and everybody told me I was nuts. So okay. if we're gonna start attacking this, we got to attack it at all fronts, including Oklahoma's law to imprison women for having their babies killed by their abusive male husbands in their womb. Okay. And finally, and finally, um, when it comes to a woman's rights, um, nowhere, what they don't state is that there's nowhere in the Constitution that said we couldn't have an abortion. So how can they put in that we can't if there was never a law that said one thing or the other? There, when, they wrote the, the, when they wrote it, there was nothing about the woman in that regard. Right. So they have no right to say that there was or was not period. You're 100 percent right. And as you yeah. recall, the Constitutional Con Convention was attended by 50 white, 55 rich white men. There were mm -hmm. no women, no people of color, except maybe Alexander Hamilton. And um, and uh, and women were in no way, shape or form represented in the writing of the Constitution of the United States of America. But in the constitutions of the indigenous tribes, it was the women who ran the show. And if we're gonna call ourselves originalists with the law, we need to go to the indigenous societies and, and, and beyond the, the, the white societies. Very well spoken, so, thank you, Mary. Let me, let me just comment real quick on Mary's points because she brought up yes, some really please. great points. So Mary's right about a lot of things, right? And the, one of the things, well, first I wanna bring up the fact what she said is when we fail to address things and laws we see happen in our states, and we do not act on local levels, we are just, it, it perpetuates these things to get to the federal level. And sometimes I think, sometimes we get too hyper-focused on federal politics and we forget local politics. Local politics are extremely important. They have the most effect on our lives more than anything, right? It has a direct effect on our everyday lives. So it is extremely important that we are always organizing and we're always being active and proactive 
and vigilant about what's happening at us and us in our state level because that's going to directly impact us. And then if we, we we're making sure we're paying attention to who we're electing at the local level and our states and regional levels, and we can prevent a lot of this from having to get to the to the Supreme Court. So I want to say that one. And then two, equal rights amendment. <laughs> Women. When we try to, we're, we are still fighting to get the Equal Rights Amendment to even recognize women as a, as a class, as our sex, and protected in equal right in, in the Constitution. And part of the reason that the, Alito could even argue about this was because there is no 28th Amendment to protect and add women, ratify into the Constitution to protect, put us in a protected class. Because if sex was protected, the gender, women's gender, sex was protected under in there, he could not make this argument because it would have been ratified. And even though we have met all the provisions to do so, we've met all the standards to do so, we still don't have it. So, so I just want to say that this is where we're at. That we have been we have been working on over 99 plus 100 years to get them to remove the time space so that the Equal Rights Amendment can be added to the Constitution so women will be a protected sex under the law in the Constitution. And we already have all the states. We already have all the time limit provisions everything. We just need them to put us in there so we have no longer have to argue for protections under domestic violence, protections under the, anything we're do, we're related to our class, um, our sex, you know. So I just want to add that and then I'm moving forward because I know we have a lot of questions. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. It's almost exactly 100 years ago that the Equal yes. Rights Amendment was put forward by Alice Paul after she was beaten uh, for demonstrating in front of the White House. And among the other things, the signs they were carrying in front of the White House were quotes from Woodrow Wilson's own books. So there you go. Okay, thank you for that. Mary, thank you. Uh, uh, Christian, Charlotte, Dennett. Charlotte, you're next, then Dennis uh, and Joel. Charlotte. Hi there, you hear me okay? We can. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a perfect segue into what I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm taking off my pipeline politics book hat and going back to when I was an active feminist in Vermont uh, tr trying to get the uh, Vermont State ERA passed, and I headed up the NOW campaign. We narrowly lost, narrowly, by less than 1%, I believe. And my, my uh, explanation for that is that we did not go into rural areas enough, and that's where the right wing goes. So if you want to organize uh, locally, you should really think about getting into rural areas. Now, the other thing I want to add in the course of doing that, I started to research uh, the origins of the uh, criminalization of abortion. And what I learned, and I wrote about out back then, was guess what the first state was that criminalized abortion? I'll answer it because limited time. Massachusetts. What was the second state to adopt criminalization of abortion? It was Vermont. Uh, then I looked at the timing, 18, I believe it was 1860. And uh, what I learned is that it was doctors and uh, actually factory owners. Um, and I can't think what else, local, local powerful people that came behind this. And why? Because they saw this as an economic issue. In other words, it was after the Civil War, uh, the troops were coming home. And all of a sudden you see the birth of this uh, pro-family, uh, get, get the girls, the Yankee women back home because a lot of Yankee women were working in the Lowell textile mills. So that's when you see this passage of this bill. And what I've been able to track is that periodically, whenever there is uh, the possibility of um, unemployment, that's when you see the attacks on women. And for, I'll just give you one example. And that is in um, 1972, George Gilder, who uh, wrote a book called Sexual Suicide. He was the, uh, uh, the godson of David Rockefeller, by the way. He wrote this book saying that when, when men are unemployed, they resort to muscle and phallus. So what you got to do is you got to get the women back home so that you do not have unrest. Now, I, I, I've seen these cycles repeat themselves. And the only thing I can say is now people are saying, oh, no, we don't have massive unemployment because of uh, people 
are choosing to leave the job. But I, I would wager that with the coming automation that is artificial intelligence, automation, robotization, the big boys have done it, have, have perceived that there will be considerable unemployment Therefore, get the women home barefoot and pregnant. If anybody has any more information on that, I'll, I'll put my email in the uh, message okay, here. Thank you for that, Charlotte. Uh, Christian, do you want to comment before we go to Dennis Bernstein? Well, I think, you know, what's just what Charlotte's talking about is controlling women. And I agree. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, in some ways, I think this is we're going back to, I mean, in so many ways we're seeing because. I mean, and I maybe you brought it up earlier too, even with the birth control, right? So we know that also there, they are also now trying to, the states that also have passed abortion bans are now, uh, they're making it illegal to buy contraception and trying to outlaw contraception. So what does that leave a woman uh, or a pregnant person, right? So you can't, you can't have an abortion. You can't have contraception, protect yourself from getting pregnant. <sighs> But there's no response, all the responsibilities placed on a woman. And if you choose to, uh, so you're, I mean, what are you supposed to do? All right. So, uh, so the only other thing to do is become, a, I mean, a woman can become celibate and abstinent and not have sex at all. Um, if she's married, um, you know, that's what her, these are her options, right? To choose to have, that's her only, that's the, the woman's choice that she would have to do. And I'm just telling you, this is what they're leaving women to do, right? And so I'm saying, because there's no responsibility held on the man at all. So women are put in place where they have limited options. And I really feel like this is really about controlling women in some ways. Um, I don't think they're good measures. And I, don't, and I don't know what the whole part of it is. I feel like, I also feel like it's a way to also still oppress people and, and people of color because it's gonna criminalize those of color because people who can afford abortions are still gonna have abortions, right? We know the people who have money will still be able to find ways to have them. They'll be able to go out of state, be able to go out of the country and have their abortions and come home. They'll be able to go to states who have protections in their state legislators. To, you know, I mean, once it's over, oh, rolls of return, they'll be able to do it. But I'm saying, but people who can afford it will be able to go to get them and, and have them done. But those who can't will still be the ones who are going to be the most um, affected by this. So people of color, um, people with who are poor and in poverty, it's the same group who are affected. You're, you are going to be on emergency list. Your whole life is going to be affected by it. Um, people will be able to see this public information. I mean, it's just a way of complete control all the way around. You got that right. Okay, thank you, Christian Nunez of National Organization for Women. We're going to go to Dennis Bernstein. Dennis is the host. Uh, Dennis, if you'll unmute. Dennis is the host of the Flashpoint show, which is, originates in Berkeley at the uh, uh, KPFA, and he's syndicated all over the country and a great friend of these calls. Dennis, great to have you with us. Uh, um, let's hear what you got to speak. Okay, um, really appreciate the presentation uh, and a question for the guests, very practical, has to do with the, uh, particularly in light of what happened in Buff Buffalo, but the potential now for extra legal uh, responses, for violent responses. I, uh, back in the day, I wrote a book about Henry Hyde. I mentioned this before. Uh, these are people, including Hyde, who would, who would sort of make a, a campaign stop at um, trials for uh, those people who killed, who were willing to murder uh, doctors who did abortions. I'm worried about the violence now, about the synergy in particular between the vote supremacists, uh, the, the people who are suppressing the vote and those now empowered uh, to take a more active anti-abortion uh, role. Is it what kind of, are people thinking about this, how to deal with this, uh, keeping an eye on how these people might be working together now? Christian, that's <laughs> To, to uh, important point, uh, um, what, what do you got to say to Dennis? Yeah, I, Dennis, you're absolutely right. I think there is a huge concern for safety and violence because they do feel empowered. When you have your justices, and, you know, empowering them, telling them that they agree with their with their viewpoints about this not being a right, and you have 
you know, right wing conservatives who are hyping them up, saying that their people are being murdered. And, and then you have state legislators making it a homicide and telling them that they're killing, you know, and they're and then you have other states trying to make it personhood, a uh, fetus's personhood. You're basically empowering these extremists to make it feel, make them feel, you know, like they have a right, um, like every other extremist. They have a right to go forth and do the things they do. I mean, we already have to worry about those who are already very aggressive toward abortion providers as they are already are. That still exists. There still has to be protections and abortion escorts to this day. There are still a clinic uh, uh, escorts to this day to protect providers right now because there is still they are still highly aggressive toward providers. So I don't know if you've ever been to rallies, but sometimes the rallies get so aggressive um, with the anti's, uh, they're they're fired up, they're aggressive, and they're getting more aggressive because they feel empowered because what we're seeing by some of these things that are happening in legislations. So I think there's a major concern, and I think that we have to make sure that for those of us who are um, who have the ability to have services or who have um, pro bono legal fees or services, that we all are coming together in solidarity to work to support this effort. Um, to provide protections as much as possible, um, because I think that right now it's 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 really concerning overall. I I'm concerned that we're going to a lot of things are going to happen. I think we just have to figure out how do we protect each other um, and make sure that we are keeping ourselves safe. And when we see um, things that are not safe, that we remove ourselves and don't engage in the hostility. I always tell my activists, don't engage in hostility. Um, you know, advocate rally, but do not engage in it with people who are hostile. I think we also have to remember, um, given the way that the Alito opinion is written, that um, he is arguing um, sub rosa that there's no there's no constitutional protection in his mind or mm -hmm. in the conservatives' mind for gay rights, for gay marriage, right. for interracial marriage, right. um, for uh, access to contraception, uh, to a whole lot of other stuff, uh, but that is part of the cultural. Uh, a people that we've seen in this country. And um, it's very troubling. And as Dennis warns, of course, uh, we can expect uh, increasing violence, uh, not only on the issue of uh, a woman's right to choose, but, all but of also them. on you know, gay rights and so on. Well, you know, and just, and just like, um, what was it? Uh, one of the, rep the individuals from uh, Indiana, I think it was Braun, who made the comment about how he feels that interracial marriage should be left up to the states is that if that's legal or not, you know? Um, and so that's what we're seeing happening. So these, these are, it's so much in, and, and we have Florida with the don't say gay bill, you know, or, or that was passed. And so we are definitely seeing that everyone and they're getting charged up, they're getting riled up because they see that the, Justice, the Supreme Court justices who we thought would be there for the people, they are to make impartial, non-personal decisions are not able to do that. So for those extremists and who also know that Trump stacked that court, they are feeling riled up to pass these this horrible, horrendous laws that are fueled with violence because they know that the Supreme Court is not going to support us and hold us, up, you know, hold us up. Exactly, and so it's a you know it's a revenge of the of the uh, of the Puritans um, against those people who have insisted on human rights at the most basic level. Mm -hmm. uh, Joel Siegel, our constitutional lawyer and co-convener, you've had your hand up for a while. We're going to follow you with Ruth Strauss and then Derek, uh, Neil, and Eric. But go ahead, Joel Siegel. You hear a dog in the background. I, I can't control the dog. <laughs> but first of all, it's great to be with uh, my dear friend Christian Nunez. Um, the right wing is probably not real happy that Christian Nunez is the president of now. Uh, she's one of the best organizers that I've ever met. The powerful thing about the Grassroots Election Protection Coalition broadcast is there's just so many very powerful organizations that are that are on this. Um, weekly call. So there's a lot of allies here, Christian, but there's a great article that's in the New Yorker magazine. Um, and I, it's probably, it's, it's what the life of the mother might mean in a post row America quote, we are going to see more deaths and more injuries. Gazala Maidi and Obi 
GYN and Dow said, I don't have to speculate about that at all. So the, the Achilles heel of the um, anti-life, I'm sorry, I don't know, I don't know what to call them anymore. Um, the anti-abortion movement is death to the mother. Um, medical evidence is very hard to refute, whether you're in a court of law or the court of public opinion. What I think we're going to need to do is have a series of national town hall meetings with progressive doctors. I've had a lot of battles with the AMA over my years as the author of Medicare for All. I used to be hailed in to their meetings and they used to try to kick my butt. <laughs> and I actually, I kicked theirs a lot, but um, you got AMA, you got ACGME, you got Physicians for a National Health Program, but there needs to be a series of town hall meetings and symposiums with doctors and nurses, especially the OBGYN community, um, to find out what is gonna happen to the life of the mother and the unborn child. For example, if they have you know, illnesses when they actually have the pregnancy, the child is born with you know, horrendous you know, birth defects. The right wing is now talking about the governor of Mississippi went on MSNBC and said they're gonna expand foster care and, and adoption agencies now. This is what they're actually planning, which is insane. But Christian, the, the question I wanted to ask is, how, how do we get a national conversation in the press, in the Congress? I know Harvey's very good at it. I know you are too, but I've noticed that the doctors are very silent right now. And this is not the time for the doctors to be silent. And I find having dealt with doctors, you know, either battling them or working with them, they're quite conservative and they're very fearful. But it's time for progressive doctors to step up and speak out because I really think the future of Roe will be contingent upon medical evidence that by overturning Roe versus Wade, the real death panels will be the Supreme Court and state legislatures. Those, those will be the true death panels. That's the question I have. How do we get the doctors to start speaking radio, television, town hall meetings? We could even do one here and it'd be great. If, um, we'd have Christian, you know, in leadership in terms of asking her to either host or participate because she's really effective. Thanks. Christian? No, that's a, that's a good question. I'm, I'm, I'm also going to look and see if I found any type of orgs where, where providers are organizing um you know, organizing together outside of ones that are not, outside of abortion providers. I'm curious to myself to see if they have been any um, providers who, who come together in solidarity regarding this issue. Um, and if anybody knows of any groups, please let me know because I definitely would like to reach out to them myself. I do know of abortion groups that, you know, clinics have come together, but I'll have to look and see if there are, I haven't really run across any but I think all I have to do is to reach out and ask. And I think that's a good way to do it is definitely to reach out and make the contact the introduction and, you know, make maybe to, um, I actually have a meeting this week with um, the, the organization of OBGYN. So I'll reach out to that person, the president there and talk to them and see if there's possibly a way to get them involved. Um, but I think we just have to make the introductions and ask and see how we can bring people in um, and in and, and support of this movement. Um, in talking about this, the series of this, because the other part, Joel, you, when you talk about this, you bring it up is the fact that we also know that the black maternal mortality rate is, is extremely high. And there is so much institutional racism in the healthcare system to women of color who are not given the same quality of care or access to care. And then we talk about women living in rural areas they have to go so far to just to get access to OBGYN in care in the first place. So some of them have to drive hundreds of miles just to go see OBGYN. So there's an accessibility issue to maternal, you know, OBGYN in care, reproductive care as well. And when you're talking about women being now being forced to have pregnancies and you don't even have the right access to care or quality care, or you don't have the insurance to cover the care you need because you're right on the borderline of not being qualified for Medicaid or Medicare and you can't afford it, who's gonna cover this? We don't talk about these things. We don't talk about people who are living one, $2 over Medicaid so they can't even pay for their, for their board, you know, the OBGYN care or things like this. We don't talk about any of these things. 
And so, and they haven't thought to talk about them. And they also don't talk about all, and I'm going to just say it straight out. I'll talk about the, about the adoption thing because I'm really sick of this adoption argument. There are so many children who are waiting to get homes right now. There are adoption centers full of children who don't even have homes right now. A lot of children who are not newborns, who have been waiting to get adopted, who spend their age out of adoption homes and centers because they are not cute little newborns. So for this whole argument that um, we are going to open up more adoption places and you can't even place the children who are in foster care and adoption places right now because they don't meet the ideal type of child. I, I don't wanna hear that argument anymore because <laughs> there's a lot of little beautiful children who have been waiting to get adopted and have to be aged out of adoption in foster care because no one has adopted them because they don't meet the ideal type of child or aged child. So we need to have that talk to you. Christian, the, the only organizations that, that I worked with over the years in Congress that were never sellouts was the National Medical Association, which are black doctors, the Hispanic Medical Association, and then Physicians for a National Health Program. Um, if, if they issued some kind of a report on what is gonna happen that a lot of the doctors that what they're really worried about is if there might be a miscarriage that could cause the death of the mother, a lot of them are really concerned that they might be prosecuted and go to jail because they're not sure. Do they, they, do they have to get permission, you know, to do the abortion because of the miscarriage? But those are the three organizations which would definitely be on the side of the pro-choice movement. And they may have already done these the studies, once that study is done, there could be congressional briefings, there could be PR media tours. I really think that it'll be the medical evidence that might shut this down. It's gonna be very hard for a state legislator or a member of Congress to say, I, I'm all for you know murdering, uh, especially women of color because of this stupid law, because that really is what it would be tantamount to, would be first degree murder and that you knew that the mother was going to die uh, because you would not allow for there to be an abortion. And even though these states pass these laws, they're, they're pretty bogus, by the way, if the life of the mother is in jeopardy. What the doctors are saying in the New Yorker magazine is that's a real gray area. Then you got the heartbeat law and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, I'll be more than happy but, but to Joel, help. But I, I think, but I think it's a good answer you're saying, but I also question that because there are people out there saying to young women and girls, because they don't have exclusionary incest and rape in these laws, that, well, if you're raped, just go ahead and lie there and take it yeah. because it, it could benefit you. It might be good for you. You, you, can, you can get right. something from it. When you right. have legislators who are willing to say that, women and men legislators who are willing to say that, that if you are raped, go ahead and take it. Just lay there and take it because it might be something that good can come from it as their justification to why they are not having exclusion to rape in that abortion ban. That questions me that they would even listen to the factual knowledge of you know, medical advice. And I'm not laughing because it's funny. I'm just seeing like the nonsense of these people, you know, like, but I still am all for trying anybody and everything, any way to try it. But I just want to say, this is where we're at here. These people, it's not, it's, it's irrational. This is a, this is, this is just irrational, some of the thought process, but I agree with you. I'm willing to make calls to whoever we need to try to get them on our side. So I would make those calls with you, but I want us to really talk about how irrational and, and seeing some of the thought process is of some of these legislators. Well, we did have a congressperson who said that, uh, or some, I think he was in the Congress said that biologically, if you're being raped, uh, you can't get pregnant. <laughs> and yeah, I, I think that the real reason for this <sighs> is that Donald Trump wants the power to rape a woman and force her to have his kid. But that's a whole other discussion. It, it is We're traumatic. Not, it is cruel. It's, it's, it's evil. It's just wrong. It's just it is evil. absolutely. And since we've been talking about doctors, uh, we have Dr. Ruth Strauss, uh, a cardiologist on the phone. Uh, uh, Ruth, uh, do you want to go ahead? We have 95 people on the call. Uh, go ahead, Ruth Strauss. Um, yeah, Christian. Um, 
personal um, idea wait, wait, wait. that we're having a hard time hearing you. Okay, can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay, so Christian, um, I did high risk OB um, uh, as part of my training, and I'm happy to join whatever network uh, you have of physician, of progressive physicians, whatever. So um, I'll give my information to Harvey and he can pass it along. Well, just you. Uh, Ruth, you're, you're really going in and out. You're not uh, dealing with the microphone well, but um, uh, please put your contacts in and, and please do contact Ruth. Uh, uh, wait, uh, I've got, I've got more that I wanted to say. Can you hear me now? Well, you're, so, you're so, somehow going in and out. You're not uh, with the uh, microphone properly. Okay, it may be this computer. There, there, there. Now you're good. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, speak loud. Okay, okay. So anyway, um, what I was going to say is it's so ironic what uh, you are saying about uh, foster care because last night, somebody who is a right-wing friend of mine sent me something about Melania Trump who started an organization for people who term out or get too old for foster care. I mean, it, you know, like they say, you can't make stuff up. Um, right. Uh, what I wanted to say is that, you know, I, I personally remember um, as a medical student uh, helping a woman deliver a baby that had no brain or the back of his head. And she was six months along. And um, if she had not had us help her deliver that baby in a sense, um, you know, which was to dilate her cervix and not have her go through real labor. Um, she would have died. And I, I've never forgotten that. I mean, I'll go to my grave. It was it was a horrible, horrible situation. Um, but the, the other thing I wanted to say, and it's it's certainly anecdotal, but a lot of the people on this call, I think, will relate to it. The protest uh, here in Los Angeles on Saturday, and I had uh, sewn a handmaid's tale um, costume and made the hat and the whole bit and I had a big sign and as I was walking back from the protest it was about a seven block walk and I thought to myself I'm gonna hold my sign up high because sometimes when you do that people will drive by and they'll honk and then my second thought was you frigging idiot somebody could drive by and shoot you for that sign and then my third thought was wait a minute been protesting since the 60s. I have never had that thought cross my mind ever until that day of all the protests I've been in. I never thought of being shot. And these right wing people are just so violent. I get in my car and that's when I hear about the Buffalo shooting. So like I said, it's anecdotal, but I think a lot of people can relate to that. It's really, really bad. Um, thank well, you for being here. Thank you, Ruth. It, it is yeah. the last gasp of the old Puritan hierarchy, and uh, they are they are taking it as far as they can. Christian, do you want to comment on that? We have um, we're getting to the top of the hour, but this is a pretty powerful discussion. I don't think I want to cut it off. We have four people waiting to speak. Uh, <laughs> Christian, do you want to speak to the fear of violence that we're now experiencing among? Yeah, the, the I, I think it goes with. Movement? Yeah, I think it just goes with Dennis is saying earlier. I think that, you know, it's just an escalated fear because of what we're seeing and how they feel entitled and charged up because what, what they're seeing being passed by a lot of these laws and what the Supreme Court's um, the justices are doing. So I think that, um, you know, I, I just want to continue to encourage everyone that, you know, don't feel um, use your voice, but do it safely, you know? So I, I say, use your voice. I go to rallies all the time, but I also assess the situation, <laughs> you know, cause I have a child and, um, but I encourage everyone to don't be afraid, but you know, there's no reason to engage in and get aggressive in, in, in the point of uh, making your point. Um, so I just encourage everyone to be safe in your, in your process. That's all I have to say. I'm, you know, Thank you. Right okay. Now. Neil Penn, you've had your hand for a while. And then Derek and, um, Eric and Michael, Neil Penn. I, I, I do have to drop pretty soon too. Uh, go ahead, Neil. Oh, yes. okay. Well, uh, I'd Christian. like to thank all the speakers. This has been an incredibly informative discussion. There certainly are many facets to it. Uh, to summarize and then give the suggestion, 
is A, no doubt Roe versus Wade being overturned is foreshadowing a whole lot of other pretty ugly and undemocratic things. Two, uh, Republican legislators um, are, well, I don't need to comment on that. It's obvious to everyone. And three, there is unfortunately a very reactive uh, populace among the disenfranchised uh, whites. One way that this can be possibly utilized is recently in the Senate, knowing that it would not be passed, there was a vote for legislation that would protect Roe uh, versus Wade type of protections. As a result of that, we are now able to identify every repugnant who voted against that and possibly through organizations like Swing Left and others that send uh, contact voters, we'd be able to reach out to, and this is a strange set of uh, allies, the reactive right day-to-day uh, -day people because this is a performance contradiction of uh, being we know from uh, recent surveys, over 50% of Republicans feel this should be a decision between a woman and her physician. So if we <laughs> outreach to them, amplify the contradiction between their elected officials and violating their personal choice, there's a possibility that we could flush some of these uh, outrageous uh, Republican senators uh, and have them packing. I'd love to get feedback well, on this. Uh, I certainly don't want to just engage in wishful thinking. Thank you, Neil. And one of the things we've been discussing every week is the, the need to get a grassroots campaign going so that people can you know, do uh, uh, personal organizing. Um, uh, Christian, uh, do you want to talk about that? And, and then we'll go to Derek, um, uh, Michael, and Eric, and uh, then we'll probably move on. I know you have to move on. Christian, yeah. uh, uh, what about Republicans uh, coming to the pro-choice side here? Yeah, we know. And it's interesting because they are, I think when it comes to women's rights um, and, the, and their decision regarding their um, bodily autonomy, there is more solidarity than anything outside of Congress. <laughs> because unfortunately, when what we saw regarding the Women's Health Protection Act vote last week, they, it was completely split party, right? Um, but when we look at overall, we see that 70% or more of, um, of everyone believes that, that women should have the right so I do believe, I agree with Neil, there is a way to reach out to even Republicans and talk to them about why this is a woman's right to choose and why this right should get into all. I think there is a way we have to do that. We have to reach out to everyone. We can't just only stay on one side. We can't win that way. So we are going to have to figure out how do we talk to those who understand the importance of women's rights um, and women's autonomy in order to try to get them to come to the side on that vote. Very good, thank you for that. Uh, Derek, Derek Reuter. Yes, uh, Derek Reuter, Vermont, uh, from Vermont's National Progressive Party. I'm also co-founder of Demand Progress and PCCC with Aaron Swartz and Marvel's first website. So that gives me about 25 plus years in organizing for progressives in entertainment and in tech. And what I'd like to comment on right, right now while I'm at Grauman's Theater in Hollywood is this Saturday, I got to see Ruth talk at the Planned Parenthood March. And let me tell you, it was poignant, strong, and a terrifying story. She's a very brave woman and leader and legal authoritative um, representative for, our, for the movement of uh, women's rights. Because what this is, is we need to use stronger language. It's um, really attack on the women's body, it's, it's slavery. We need to be more, use stronger language, be more direct because, and you have to hit them head on because when you butt heads with them, with debate on ideas and your ideas hitting home, they will cower, they will back out and they will lay off because they will not win the argument when both entertainment and tech bears down on that truth. 
in the conversation. And I want to say over the past 25 years, from Trojan horses to battering down doors, um, we've made a lot of change in tech and in entertainment. When I first consulted the Film Foundation of Producers and Directors, there was not a single female member on the board. Wow. And now today, the board is nearly half women. And with more artists and producers coming down the pike, getting enough material in, that board of the Film Foundation will be 50-50. And in tech, we have a 200% to 300% increase in hiring of women for project management roles and above high tech positions where they are the manager roles developing the new tech that we use. So I say batter down the doors more, get women, get men into the kitchen on the barefoot and get women into the office Mm -hmm. because we're ready. They're ready. We want um, total gender neutrality in the unions and in the workforce. And the trouble comes down when it comes down to the banks, the investors and the talent agencies which are more conservatively owned and they get to choose what talent gets out there. So when you put enough crowd and emphasis on a stand an artist or producers makes, then that talent agency has no effect. They'll go to capitalize off the fame or the, okay. or the trend. So you give them a positive trend. Don't shy away from them when they take these stands and we'll win this debate and we'll okay. stop them in their tracks. And that's, that's, one thing you have to remember, uh, Derek, and everybody, is that in the 2020 election, uh, Donald Trump lost the female vote, which is the majority of voters as females. He lost the female vote 58 to 42, which is, to a certain extent makes us a matriarchy. Um, uh, Christian, you want to comment on that? And we got three more calls in. Uh, you let us know when you need well, to. Well, what I will say, what Derek says, I agree that we have to be very direct with our language. Um, and like to the point and hit and hit home to the point. I do agree with that. Um, I also think that what, what I will say is that we need more groups like tech and allies um, from tech and arts to step forward and speak out on these causes um, and work with, you know, progressives and groups like that. So we need to help, you know, and, and, and do it in ways where they'll coming on to campaigns and, and using their work and their platforms to be able to uplift the messaging. So if you have resources and you know people who are willing to do that, let us know because I think that's where that could be effective is like, how do, can they use their platforms to get the messaging out of what we're trying to do and the strategy out? Good, thank you much. Okay, Sluggo, um, you, Eric, Sluggo, Michael, Wendy. Sluggo, real, real quick. I just wanted to say, um, PDA has phone banks to help elect pro-women's rights progressives. And I'm going to put a link in there so people can volunteer to help make a difference with PDA. Very good. Thank you for that. And remember that PDA is our partner and, in these calls and very and Harvey, uh, a big piece of this. And Harvey, I have a hard stop at 615, so just to let you know. Uh, okay, that's seven minutes. Um, um, Eric, Michael, and Wendy, real quick. Eric Lazarus, Michael Brackney, and Wendy, go ahead and- Hi, great to meet you. Um, so first quick point is um, the two podcasts about the two victories, um, I, I think people really ought to listen to um, Words to Win By, the, the victory uh, in the first season about the victory in Ireland, and then the season that just came out, um, the victory in Argentina, Anat Shankar Osario, I think, is a really first-rate um, uh, messaging expert, and she's had these two victories around reproductive rights, and so maybe we could uh, bring her on here and, and have her talk to us. Um, by the way, I have a question, though. Um, if, you know, Murkowski and uh, Collins um, do put um, up a bill that, um, you know, I assume would have fewer weeks or whatever, do they have the votes to overcome the filibuster? I, or is this completely theater? Um, I'm Eric, thanks so much. Yeah, I don't know because I mean, the reality of it is I don't believe, this is not compromisable. I mean, women's right to choose is not compromisable. So I can't see anything being voted on that would be an amendment that would make it pass. That's just really what I believe. Okay, thank you for that, Michael Brackney, and then Wendy. Michael, 
we're we're just running out of time here. Oh, and okay, great. An Am I on mute now? Go for it. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Great, great. Thanks. I just want to call our attention to another podcast that came out last week on on Freakonomics Radio. It's called Abortion and Crime Revisited, giving an astonishing report on the research done by two economists and perhaps sociologists a couple of years ago, noting that the large decrease in crime noticed during the 90s was associated with the onset of abortion in the 70s, namely that wanted children tend to grow up as non-criminals and unwanted children have a, have, a, have, a, have a comparatively terrible start in life. And that the criminal yeah. population tends to increase when un more unwanted children are born. An astonishing podcast that, that helps us understand better what really, what, what is truly pro-life. Right, and in his book, uh, Baby and Child Care, Dr. Spock in 1946 um, argued that the number one thing you should do for your children is to hug them and to be mm -hmm. physically affectionate. And they did a study on that and he was 100% right. Children mm -hmm. who were, uh, had physical affection from their parents had much better lives that transcended race, class, religion, um, uh, uh, even divorce. So there you go. Michael, thank you for that. Christian, we're going to go to Wendy Lederman. I know you're down to uh, three minutes. Wendy, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, and I appreciate Sorry, I have to be kind of quiet. Um, but I just, I, I brought up that study last week as well. And I appreciate Michael bringing that up about how crime rates dropped within 15 years after the start of um, abortions. Um, I wanted to speak just quickly about um. The, the rate, like my mom worked for HRS, like with foster care. And I personally like was one-on-one -on -one with a lot of the kids that grew up in foster care. And um, just, you know, like what Joel was saying of having a panel of doctors, I think that psychologists should be involved with that, not only to express the psychology of women who have abortions that, um, you know, I'm sure it's not always the choice for them that they want to make and the effect that it has on women who have had to give up um, pregnancies, you know, that's got to be hard, but then also the kids that grow up unwanted in custody of the state, which is just such a disgusting way for a child to grow up, and then how most of those kids end up homeless because there's no social safety net for them, and that's economic warfare, and just one other quick point I put in the, the chat about um, eugenics, and a lot of same right-wing policies, a lot, a lot of these, and the ancestors of these people now, they practice eugenics, which was social engineering, and there were, like, I think 60,000 forced sterilizations between the 30s and the 70s of just um, d designing the, the society that they want to have. And it's just clearly about control of women. Nobody cares about what's going to happen to these kids. And just the hypocrisy is, is staggering. And thank you so much, guys. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, Wendy. I completely agree with everything she's saying. It, it is just about control. And, and a lot of the practices that what they they've done in the past are just complete hypocrisy to what they're doing now and so yeah totally agree christian nunez of the Na president of the national organization for women we uh, are honored with your presence we've gone an hour and a quarter here um uh, your presentation has been fabulous it's been a, a great thing to have you on uh, we will continue with this me. dialogue uh, uh thank you so much for being with us and we will support you and your work and um, and let's um, let, let's get through this storm uh, and yes. protect not only the, a woman's right to choose, but gay rights, gay marriage, interracial everything, marriage, and the other uh, things that they're attacking. Thank you, Chris. Yes, thank you. Everything, and then you don't know how to reach me if you need anything else. And remember, we are not free if one of us is not free, even if our shackles are different. Audrey Lord. So let's keep thank the word so fighting. Out. I will be sending you a piece on indigenous originalism about the right uh, among the indigenous societies of, of, of how women had that right and that uh, it certainly should transcend this white guy constitution that these um, uh, uh, crazy people keep talking about. Thank you so much, Christian. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. You too. Amazing. Bye. All right, it is uh, 6.15 Eastern time, uh, uh, 3.15 in California. 
we have a bunch of stuff that we want to continue with. I want to start with um, Julie Weiner. Julie, are you, you're there. I can see your um, 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 forest scene. And um, uh, we want to talk about what's going on in New York, if you're, if you're still with us. Um, I, I also want here. to talk to Susan. Su Julie, are you there? I'm here. I don't know what happened to my video. I'm sorry about that because I'm wearing right. a shirt. Listen, the tell I'm us wearing a shirt that says "Never Again" and has a horrible image of a coat hanger on it. <laughs> okay, so um, you have an important uh, development in New York about the voting machines. Can you fill us in real quick? And also, yes. uh, we know that the uh, court in New York uh, just today has overturned um, a Democratic map and um, handed probably a couple of congressional seats to the Republicans, which is the opposite of what's happening in other states. But go ahead and tell us about the voting machine situation, please. Yeah, it's very regrettable, this decision to overthrow that map. And again, I'm sorry my, I'm sorry my video isn't working. I don't know what just happened. Well, go ahead, we like your truth. Um, yeah, okay, so New York State uh, Assembly just Okay, the good news is on the Senate side, our bill written and submitted by the chair of the elections committee of the New York State Senate has passed, has passed the, um, has passed the elections committee and has passed the finance committee. And um, that's great. It, we expect it to pass the Senate once it passes the assembly. However, unfortunately, the Assembly Elections Law Committee just held its last planned meeting of the year. Our legislative session ends on June 2nd. We have exactly two weeks and two days, or one and a half days now, to find a way to pass A1115. Otherwise, New York State is gonna go way, way backward. We currently vote on hand-marked paper ballots. Most um, voters in the state still also vote on voting machines that are just standalone um, ballot marks, standalone scanners. I keep getting okay. To my video and, and I can't. Burning. So right now, I desperately need help from people. We need everyone you know in New York State to call. Assembly member, Speaker, um, Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty, and Election Law Chair um, Latrice Walker, who's a heroic and wonderful African American activist. She just waged a very serious fight for bail reform to try and defend what's left of bail reform in New York State. And but she has not yet apparently been persuaded that the right to vote and have your votes counted as cast on safe, secure ballots is part of the right to vote, uh, is part of access to the polls. If our votes can be changed after we last see them um, inside the voting machines, we, we don't have a right to vote. We have a right to watch our votes be slide away from us, watch our progressive legislature slide away without knowing why or how it happened. So it's very, very urgent that we keep two voting machines that are already have election security experts are saying they have multiple security vulnerabilities. In court, this has been said. Um, thank you very much for posting that petition. Okay, thank you. It's posted. Help uh, us reach out. Please help us reach out. You can call. You can call Speaker Hasty even if you're out of New York State. You can call Assembly Member Walker even if you're out of New York State. Uh, the the link that you just got, yes, I will reach out to Howie Hawkins, Jeffrey. Thank you. The link you just got is to send to residents of New York State. It'll give them the address of their um, legislator. But you can also you can also uh, you can also write to Speaker Hasty or Election Law Chair Latrice Walker. Great, thank you, thank you, Julie. Thank you. thank you for that. And and you know, we, and with the New York court, we are seeing a, a democratically gerrymandered map that was thrown out, while the Republican gerrymandered maps are staying intact in places yeah. like Ohio, which is you quite. Uh, Susan Pinchon, 
I wanted to call on you if you could. Hey, Sluggo, uh, real, yeah. real quick, while we're still talking about New York, Joel had something Please. to say about Buffalo. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, we do want to get to that, and I think now's a good time. Joel Siegel, I know you wanted to make some comments. Uh, anyone who wants to talk about the, the latest uh, mass killing, uh, I do want to recite the Second Amendment to you, which says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security free of a free state, the right to keep and bear arms should not be abridged. And, you know, the, the Second Amendment people, as Trump calls them, always talk about the right to keep and bear arms. They never talk about the fact that the Constitution requires that that right uh, derive from belonging to a, a well-regulated militia and, and proving that your ability uh, your, to have a gun is dependent on showing that it serves the needs of a secure state. Uh, so, you know, the Second Amendment um, uh, is a lot more than a lot of these so-called Second Amendment people want to deal with. Uh, Joel Siegel, you had some comments you wanted to make about the Buffalo situation. I think other people are going to want to chime in. So let's do that. Then Susan will get to you to talk about what's happening in North Carolina uh, and in Arizona on the election bill there. So Joel Siegel, please. Thanks, Logo. So <clears throat> I, I want to throw out a few ideas, but I'm really interested in hearing from everybody. Um, I'm not sure how many more people got to get murdered by white nationalist supremacists before the government does something to crack down on these people. I, I thought one six would be enough because the one six, a lot of that was organized through the internet. The, um, the white nationalist 18 year old kid who had threatened his high school to kill them goes and buy um, weapons. He's 18 years old, I, apparently there was no back. If there was a background check, it, it, it didn't work because it's been in the press that this guy had threatened his high school class. How are you able to get, you know, weapons and, and, um, and armor if you threaten to kill your high school class? Hmm, very interesting. But the rise of white nationalist hate, murder and violence needs a much stronger federal response, not just sincere heartfelt rhetoric by presidents at funerals. And I, and I really mean heartfelt and sincere. I, I, I'm sure that Joe Biden, when he, when he speaks today, it'll be heartfelt and sincere. But, you know, we had Sandy Hook already. Um, what I'm going to suggest is that the right to bear arms and the, the First Amendment freedom of speech has to be challenged by progressives. What, why is that? Freedom of speech under the First Amendment, hate speech, which, lie, which leads to violence, is not protected speech. I, I studied the case president this weekend. I read all kinds of articles. Um, you know, can you have hate speech? Yes, you can. But if it leads to violence and can incite violence, it is not protected. So um, what I want to suggest is that in, instead of waiting for the next murders, by a Dylan Roof in Charleston, or blacks being killed when they're shopping in Buffalo, I think that President Biden should issue an executive order to the FBI and to Homeland Security. Homeland Security isn't just against terrorists from the other countries, it's Homeland Security, period. And I don't know what their budget is. I would assume over a hundred billion, I'm sure it might be more than that to monitor websites and Facebook posts to find out who are posting these white nationalist websites that Dylan Roof read and this 18 year old kid because they're being radicalized through these websites. That's, that's what's happening. If ISIS was talking about murdering Jews or non-believers, on American websites, I don't believe that they would be tolerated. I think they would be shut down. Similarly, why would posts by Americans who are white nationalists allowed to, to, to communicate via the internet? Um, when you study executive orders, you, uh, the president of the United States can issue an executive order 
to a federal agency where they have a lot of funding. Um, I, I spoke to an FBI agent, a colleague from law school about this, and what he told me was they'd like to shut down these websites too, but they don't have the legal authority to do so. So I would also suggest that there be a federal and, and state laws passed to ban these websites. Once again, First Amendment does not protect hate speech and incites and leads to violence. Now, what's the counter argument often by the left, which I find to be fallacious? That is, it, they, you say, well, it's a slippery slope argument, and if you ban this form of speech, then it will be a slippery slope to banning other speech. I, I don't buy that, and I'll tell you why. Because it's very clear from case precedent what you can ban and what you cannot ban. So it's been case precedent since, I think, the 40s that hate speech that leads to violence can be banned. So that's not a slippery slope. That's case precedent. Two questions. Number one, why are we allowing domestic terrorists to organize and and influence people in America when we know it's leading to deaths, especially of ethnic minorities. Uh, number two, what, I can't curse because we're on the radio. What in the world are we waiting for? And why hasn't there been a crackdown on, on these white nationalists? I hope the Democratic Party doesn't want to bring in the MAGA movement as the swing voter, so therefore they don't want to alienate them by taking stronger steps. But as a Jewish person whose family fled, not only did they flee Nazi Germany, but half of my family was killed in Auschwitz, I'm very sensitive about what looks like crystal knock to me. As America gets blacker and browner and people feel like if white people say, well, we're going to be replaced by those people, I think these murders and these terrorist actions are the tip of the iceberg. I think one six. And, and what you saw on Buffalo and Charleston is going to happen with more frequency. I say we ban these Internet sites. We arrest these groups. They have to be put on trial. Some of them probably need some kind of therapy or home supervision. But unless there's something punitive where you send the message that hate speech and you know violent actions will not be tolerated, they're going to keep doing it without any response from the federal government and we the people. Anyway, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Uh, Mary, Mary Stonewall, uh, we, we are at um, 628. We, we're actually at the end of our um, uh, uh, recorded session. Uh, let me, uh, uh, Mary, do you, you want to give a last word before we sign off on our recording? Thank you for that. Yeah, Joel. I did. Um, Go ahead. Uh, um, for years, I've been, for 20 years, I've been trying to get people to understand that what we can do with the internet is we can implement what city ordinances or state ordinances we have onto the internet because the internet is a virtual society being beamed into our communities. So for example, um, you're in Spokane, Washington, you're not Mary, allowed Mary, to have- Mary, we, we're gonna run out of time here. Uh, can I? Can we sign off and then um, uh, then we'll 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 resume your uh, comment and then we'll go to Myla Reeson as well. So let me sign off for the recording. Uh, uh, this has been the 95th uh, Zoom call for the uh, grassroots emergency, the Green Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition. We will meet again next week at 5 p.m. The week after is Memorial Day, and we will not meet on Memorial Day. So next week we will meet. The week following that, we will not. Um, uh, uh, we've had uh, been engineered by Mike Hirsch uh, and Steve Caruso, uh, co-convened with Joel Siegel. We've been honored with the presence of um, uh, uh, Christian Nunez of the National Organization for Women. And uh, it's been a, a, an incredibly important call. We still have 84 people with us. And so um, I, I will sign off now and um, from the recording and we will open it up for another 20 minutes uh, uh, to uh, John.